thank you for that warm applause, but I feel as though I ought to share it with our guest speaker this evening. <laughs> Um, <laughs> welcome to this uh, lecture and uh, welcome also to those of you who have been uh, trying to get tickets for this evening. Uh, we could have uh, accommodated this lecture in a, a much larger room, but we have few options at the LSE. Uh, it's great to welcome so many of you uh, here. Of course, this lecture is part of a series on Greece at the LSE uh, with the Hellenic Observatory. The Hellenic Observatory is a research unit here at the LSE, which I have the pleasure of directing. And of course, therefore, we have a number of events uh, on Greece on a regular basis here at the school. And if you wish to have more information about the events, not all of the events are quite as um, successful as tonight's uh, event. If you wish to have more information about our events on Greece, then please go to the website for the LSE and look at Hellenic Observatory. I guess that's a way of saying that actually you're very lucky to be here because we could have filled this lecture theatre um, at least twice over. Uh, so whatever logistical problems you had coming into the theatre, I promise you others were less fortunate than uh, yourselves. And of course you're here because our speaker this evening has been very much at the eye of the storm, as it were, of uh, the Greek uh, debt crisis of 2015. Uh, he's been a central figure in Greece's negotiations with the rest of the European Union and with the IMF. And he now has the prime responsibility for implementing the difficult uh, reforms and austerity measures that were agreed in the most recent third bailout uh, for Greece. Uh, Cleides Zakolotis has just come from a meeting of the Eurogroup uh, in Brussels, and uh, I think he wishes to say a few words about that meeting uh, this evening. Of course, there is the issue of Greece uh, satisfying the terms of its third bailout and securing the next tranche of the, uh, of the loan. I'm sure our speaker needs no introduction uh, this evening. In case he does, let me just mention one or two uh, headlines. Of course, he has been Minister of Finance uh, in Greece since this uh, last July. He's been a member of parliament since 2012. Uh, he's a member of the uh, Party Central Committee, the Citizen Central uh, Committee. But uh, Efklides is also a noted academic in his own right, a professor of economics who's written uh, a number of articles and papers in different languages. Uh, and uh, he also knows the British university system very well. Uh, he was educated at Sussex University and also at Oxford University. He didn't quite meet the entry criteria, I assume, of the LSE, but nevertheless. <laughs> Uh, we're able to host him this, this evening, so we've corrected that uh, oversight. Efklides has, has agreed to speak for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, that should mean that there's plenty of time for questions and answers uh, afterwards. Uh, so let's get on with it, and without further ado, can I invite you to uh, welcome our speaker this evening, Professor Efridis Zakolotis to talk about uh, economic blues, the left in government times. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin, for that uh, introduction, with one exception. Um, <laughs> the topic of the talk is economic blues, um, the left in government. And let me start with the uh, left in government and then we can get on to the economic blues uh, aspects of it. Um, the Greek government has a roadmap. Uh, the roadmap of how to get out of this crisis. It involves the recapitalization of the banks. It involves the closing of the first review with our creditors. And it involves a discussion on debt. Should all those things be successful, we feel that it will release pent-up demand in the Greek economy. There are lots of consumers who do have some money who are willing to spend but are frightened of spending because they are uncertain. There are a lot of savers who would put their money back 
into banks but are frightened about the banking sector. And there are, of course, lots of investors who would be willing to invest but are frightened about Grexit and that the programme might not work. This uh, is not a Keynesian position, since we're LSE to discuss the economics. I tend to think of this release of pent-up demand as working in lieu of devaluation. In other words, what it does is gives you greater space, great more time for the supply side measures of the economy to work. And indeed, by March 2016, we have arranged to, we have agreed with our creditors that we will be proposing uh, our development plan. Let me add as an aside that leftists share something with the Keynesian critique of the Stiglitz Keynesian type that you will all be familiar here at the LSE. We do share the importance of demand, we do share the importance about Eurozone imbalances and that it's very difficult to get the European economy going without fiscal transfers. We do share the Keynesian concern about the macro imbalances and that if Germany insists on having current account surpluses, it is very difficult for the South to be competitive. On the other hand, we share, surprisingly, quite a lot with our neoliberal opponents. That is to say that in the last analysis, the left is very interested in the supply side. It thinks that the real economy is more important than demand. Although, obviously, we have very different views on how the real economy works, between the balance between private, public and social sectors. But a central question since the beginning of the left has been who produces what for whom. Now, the economic blues we can introduce immediately now that the question has been set because the balance of forces on the production and on the supply side is still very much in the neoliberal direction. Moreover, the alternative model that the left would want to produce is not yet convincing. There are very many aspects of an alternative model in very many areas. Some people here have done very much to uh, promote these uh, alternatives but we're not quite there yet for an alternative model of production that meets both economic efficiency and demands of social justice. But it is part of the left in government to provide space for alternative social experiments that can act as examples for others in Greece and elsewhere to follow. For without a product, different production model, the left will not never recover. It's what the Keynesians and the Social Democrats didn't understand in the 1970s. Not to say since the crisis, when the Social Democrats had an ideal opportunity to turn the clock back and to say that neoliberalism has failed and we now have our own model. But that was the subject of my last lecture here, Kevin, as you know, the malaise of social dem democracy. And as you also know, it's not in my char character to continue flogging a dead <laughs> horse. Um, I hope it isn't a dead horse because there are signs that social democracy is recovering in many places and it will be interesting to see whether one of those places is Portugal over the coming days and in Spain in over the coming weeks. So let me return to the roadmap and the Greek government in power. The first, as I said to you, was the recapitalization of the banks. Um, in that happened over the last week, uh, not the weekend that's passed, the weekend before that. We passed a recapitalization law and we passed a cabinet act on how the Greek government would deal with its own shares. We had a lot of interest to uh, balance and we have, uh, in, in terms of attracting uh, private investors, but also keeping shares for the Greek government. Uh, it's a difficult issue. It's actually not an issue that even people teaching finance economics can understand because it has to do with dealers and bond dealers and so on. So on one day I would be getting an SMS from one banker saying that if I do X it will be the end of the Greek banking system, the Greek economy and the Eurozone, not to mention the planet, and the next day I would get an SMS that if I don't do X it will be the end of the Greek banking system, the Eurozone and the planet and so on. But we think we try to balance the different interests and uh, we are now rather a victim of our own success. 
because one of the things that has happened is that the recapitalization has progressed very quickly. And so the Greek government not only has to do the first milestones that was agreed over the summer, but certain aspects of the second milestones that have to do with the financial sector. There is a triangle here, which is between recapitalization at the apex and at the base, we have the corporate governance issue and the issue of the non-performing loans. And our creditors, not unwisely, say that if we're going to have recapitalization, that it's important to deal those, um, those issues as, uh, as a whole. Now, let me again say something about the blues bit. In the negotiations, you win some, you lose some. Let me say one of the issues about corporate governments. The institutions quite rightly say that over the past years, the Greek banking system has been uh, amenable to political pressures, not always of the best kind. So that loans have been given to specific firms, to specific football teams, to specific uh, individuals, not always with the transparency that you would have liked. So that the HFSF, which is the Hellenic Financial Stability Fund, which is going to control the banks, needs to have the ability to import, impose a corporate structure, uh, a, a governance structure, sorry, to stop that kind of activity, politics in the bad sense. But there is a baby and a bathwater uh, issue here, because in the... Uh, development of the banks over the last years, not only in Greece but mostly elsewhere, there is the problem of policy. Policy in the good terms, policy in the, in the good sense, policy about what you want to do with the banks. Uh, anybody who has read John Lancaster or has um, seen the balance books of uh, the, the books of a particularly large systemic bank in, in Northern Europe will be very surprised to hear, to see how much of that, uh, the asset side, is loans not to the private sector, not to the real economy, but investments in derivatives. So while we in the left are quite happy to have uh, an independence of the bank, to have a, a certain corporate governments in the bank, we actually want policies to impose on banks that they invest more on, uh, in the real economy and do less of this harmful activity that, as most students of the LSE will know, has a very high social, uh, very high private return and a very low social return. So the economic blues aspect is that it's very difficult in neoliberal times to get that balance, to get a balance of a corporate governance structure of banks that are independent, but at the same time are amenable to policies that fail, that say, that help the public interest. And part of my economic blues is that on this issue, I'm rather a conservative in that sense that I want banks to return to their old-fashioned role of taking from savers and lending to investors. And so here is a left-wing uh, financial minister who is actually making a plea for very conservative banks that do not in the, uh, spend their time dealing with derivatives, the New Deal, uh, what New Deal can be made, how you can bend the rules of the regulators, but actually focuses on the real economy. It's not something that has been very easy to negotiate with our uh, creditors. There is another issue about corporate governance, which is the remuner remunerations of people in the uh, Hellenic Financial Stability Fund and the bankers. Um, the IMF will publish uh, lots of papers nowadays on the importance of inequality and how inequality does, does not help um, development. But when it negotiates, it says that bankers should get the market rate. Uh, and we must get the best people if we're going to have the good corporate governance. We argue, on the other hand, that in a country that has lost 25% of its uh, national income and in a country where we, unemployment is 25% and unemployment of youth is over 50%, it is important if you're going to carry reforms that people feel that they're in the same boat. And being in the same boat means that it's, and that there is not one rule for the one and one rule for the other, that you do not get outrageous um, salaries. Again, this is an issue that we've had partial success with the institutions, but it has been very difficult. Let me go to the second aspect of the uh, roadmap, the closing of the first review. But let me say on the recapitalization that despite what I've said, I think things are going much better than if you'd invited me a month ago. 
things are looking quite well. There is private interest. There is a balance of interest going on here. And I do uh, 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 forecast that the whole process will end very well. Now, the closing of the first review is also very important. This is the second aspect I want to talk about, because that's what's going to release uh, the discussion on debt. There are two sets of milestones that the, the first set of milestones, which we should be completed over the next week, will release two billions for arrears. And that's what the Greek government owns to its own citizens, whether it's in VAT returns or to the local authorities, over to hospitals. So it's very important for the liquidity of the economy. And then there will be a second set of milestones, which will release one billion. We will then have the closing of the first review after that, and then we can have the discussion on debt on debt. It includes many of the things that we are agreed upon uh, that we believe are very important, like uh, dealing with tax evasion, dealing with corruption, dealing with the reform of the public administration. Um, the public administration is a very serious issue in Greece. I, as a finance minister, was very shocked that uh, every morning, I'm sure that uh, John uh, George Osborne doesn't face this, I have um, my chef de cabinet, my political uh, aide, who brings me pieces of paper that I have to sign for the transfer of some nurse from Xanthi, which is in the northern city, to Alexandrupoli. Uh, I have to sign that, and eight other people have to sign that uh, piece of paper. Uh, I don't imagine that how it holds in any other uh, uh, European country. But it's not an inefficient system. I want to emphasize that. Because why it worked for the clientelistic system of new democracy and PASOK very well. Because what does it mean? It means that if I don't sign the nurse, eventually the nurse will come to me and will say, well, Euclid, you know, why haven't you signed this? I've been waiting for weeks. And then I would have replied, if I was of the old system and the old political elite, yes, but you want to go to Alexandrupoli because it's your hometown, but your family has always voted for the other party. Isn't it about time that at least part of, the, of your family starts voting the right way? This is why the Greek government thinks that public administration is very important, because it's only in reforming the, uh, private, uh, the public administration that anything else we want to do, whether it's active labor market policies, or uh, a new investment bank, or um, new social policies can work. Because if you haven't got the public administration to do them, then they will be corrupted by the old uh, clientelistic system. And one of the reasons why we have now a better relationship with our creditors is that our creditors do firmly believe that Syriza that is not implicated in the old political system are the ones to change issues like the um, public administration, the tax, evade, tax evasion, and dealing with corruption. So we have issues that we have agreed. We have issues that we don't agree with, but which we have to do because that's the nature of the compromise. But what we are insisting, and which we are promoting, is that there should actually be assessment, economic assessment on the one hand, and social assessment. So let me give you an example. Our creditors say we have to liberalize the milk market, and that will reduce prices, and that will increase um, uh, the, com the competitiveness uh, of the Greek economy. Now, I can see a few LSE students. They know that those results don't hold unless the, the situation is of full employment. But I'll leave that aside, because I don't want to complicate things. The issue is. Does the reduction, does the increase, the, the, does the liberalization of the uh, milk, mark, uh, the milk uh, production, does it lead to lower prices? Does it lead to more competition? Or does it change rents? And who gets the rents? Does it mean that instead of Greek producers in some faraway place in Ipiros don't get the rents? Or that the rents actually now go to the supermarkets? What we have insisted is there will be an economic impact assessment of those issues. And together with the OECD, we are also going to have social impact studies. So what is the effect of Reform X on the bottom 20% of the population? That seems an important part of any negotiation with our creditors to see what are the results of the policies and whether we are right or we are wrong. We disagree also, as you know, about the household um, insolvency issue, which is very important in the addressing the issue of the non-performing loans. I want to make clear that the headline news on this issue are very misleading. 
The institutions say that the Greeks want to hold 90, save 90%, cover 70%, and now we want to cover 50%. What I want to make clear is that that 50%, 70%, 90% doesn't refer to who's pe the number of people whose houses are saved, but the number of people who can come before the courts. And we know from data that we presented to the institutions that the courts reject, on average, about one in two. So those figures are very different. In our conception, this is a very big issue. It's a very big issue because this law that protects the, the housing of the, the, your, your main house has been one of the few laws in the times of the bad times since 2010 that people felt put a flaw on the crisis. It was an important symbolic role. I say symbolic because actually the banks aren't that interested in selling off those assets because those assets are one of the most valuable assets they have in the NPLs and they expect as growth returns that um, uh, the, the red and NPLs will turn into green. So that is giving you some idea of the kind of issues that we have been uh, discussing. Finally, let me turn to the issue of debt. It's an issue that's been going for some time, but one of the gains of the Syriza government over the summer was a firm commitment that after the end of the first review, we would have a discussion on debt. So... Um, <coughs> This bit, at least, um, is an interesting part of the deal that was de dealt with. Uh, another part of my economic blues uh, is that the IMF is on our side on this issue. I didn't ever think I would say a statement like that in my long career from Oxford and to Sussex. So I, I find that uncomfortable, but nevertheless, that is the case. The IMF is supporting the Greek position that we need to have um, debt restructuring. What are the details of what the Greek government is going to do? Well, I'm not going to tell you because that's part of our negotiation and you wouldn't expect something uh, else. But let me say some of the, the, the main contours of what we think. Well, what we think is, is if there's good wills, there's tons of way, technical solutions to deal with the problem. And if there isn't a uh, good will, then any good economist uh, who's studied at LSE uh, came uh, or Oxford would be able to uh, even to, to solve um, even LSE yes um, uh, so we think that you know stable interest rates greater grace periods perhaps growth bonds all those uh, are uh, interesting more interesting though to this audience is what is the political issue at stake what we are concerned about that is there is a dissonance between the political cycle and the uncertainty that creates, and the economic cycle and the uncertainty that that creates. You, everybody knows that investors want certainty, that investors want to have a highway whether they understand in clear terms what is coming up. So if you give them a deal for only three years, they're not going to invest for more than three years. If you keep Greece on a tight leash for only three years, then you will get less investment, you will get less, vote, uh, less uh, growth, your ability to meet your fiscal targets will be diminished, and then you might get back to the old vicious circle where you don't get your fiscal targets and more reforms are demanded from you. So it's absolutely critical that this is recognized by our creditors, that unless we get a solution where there is this clear runway, there is 15 years grace period or 20 years grace period, unless we get a solution where investors can see that the crisis of Greek debt has not been put back from January to the summer of 2016 or the Christmas of 2016 or the summer of 2017, but it has actually has give, been given a specific answer, we'll be back to square one. So the view of the Greek government is that we need a solution. We can discuss some conditionality. We can discuss some phasing in during the period of the program, which, as you know, ends in, in three years' time. But it's absolutely vital that we get a clear runway, that people understand that investors can invest for seven and eight and nine years because they know the major decisions have been taken and they know the roadmap of what's coming up. So this is what we're going to be arguing for, irrespective of what technical solution meets those demands, to break this 
negative loop, this ne negative feedback me mechanism from economic uncertainty, investors not being certain that the solution has been provided by the Eurozone to the political uncertainty where uh, reforms, uh, when the reform project itself is put under threat. So having said all that about the, um, the roadmap, let me conclude with a few uh, thoughts. If there are economic blues for a left government, then think what holds for um, a left-wing finance minister. It's, if it's difficult for a left-wing government, it's more difficult for a, a finance minister to be part, uh, to have any left-wing credentials. And I have left-wing friends here who are sh sh I'm sure are running out of uh, faith that uh, I have got those left-wing credentials, but I'll allow them to speak for themselves. Um, the role of I see of a left-wing fi finance minister is to give space for alternative experiments. So when I'm asked, is the deal in July a good deal or a bad deal, the only answer is that I don't know. Because it's only as good as the strategy you have to incorporate that deal in a left-wing direction. <laughs> the final test of the deal for the left is not given a priori. It's not decided beforehand. It's not decided before uh, you have the strategy which can give space to alternative examples. So we have three parts of the deal. We have the deal, the uh, aspects which we are agreed upon and which we are going to insist that they assess that what, what their impact is, both their economic impact and their uh, social impact. There's the bits that we uh, disagree with and are discussing on pensions, for instance, and then the non-performing loans aspect that I've discussed in, in some detail. And there's the alternative program that is our own program. Can we give space for alternative experiments in health? We have a health minister who is very interested in introducing primary health care. It doesn't sound very much for a country like Britain, but it's a very big issue in Greece for both expenses and for the social inequalities that are associated with. We have, during the crisis period, great experiments in the solidarity economy and the social economy. Can we give space for that to grow and to be more integrated in the private sector and the public sector? Can we give space for alternative experiments of new ways of producing and new ways of dealing with economic needs. Can we deal with this privatization fund that was imposed on us in actually nurturing Greek assets, both real estate assets and state-organized, uh, state-owned uh, enterprises and banking assets in a way that serves the long-term interests of the Greek people? Greek real estate has been disorganized since the Ottoman times. It's time now that it's organized, nurtured, both for repaying in part our debt to our creditors, but also for investment period. That was part of the long negotiations on the night of the 12th of July and the morning 9.30 of July the 13th that we have done. So let me paraphrase my last statement, Keynes. Some, uh, since we're here at the LSE, you'll remember that Keynes in the Macmillan Committee, I think, said to those who were the Treasury view that um, we want low interest rates because we want to do things. If you stop doing things in order to have low interest rates, you're looking at the world upside down. Let me give you, finally, my own version. Left-wing people should enter the government if they can do left-wing things. If they stop doing left-wing things to, st to stay in government, then they are looking at the world upside down. And whether we will look at the world upside down will depend on the energy that we have, on the ideas we have, and the balance of forces elsewhere in Greece. But we in Syriza are committed to start looking at the world the right way up. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very much indeed. I'm going to open it up to um, a general question and answer session um, in a moment, but I'm going to take the liberty of asking a couple of questions uh, myself. 
Some years ago, Euclides was very kind to invite me to his house for uh, a dinner which I enjoyed uh, very much. And I remember pre-crisis, our discussion about the future of the left in Europe on occasions was prefixed with Euclides saying to me, what I don't understand about you social democrats is. And then there seemed to be a, a really rather alarming list of things which you didn't quite understand about social democrats. I take your talk to be telling us that in the calendar year of 2015, the compromises forced on the cities of government uh, are such that uh, we have little difference between what a social democratic government might have been forced to do and what the cities of government uh, was forced to do. You finished with the lecture by emphasizing hope for the future but conditional. Judge us in terms of what a left-wing finance minister would do in the future. So much seems to be conditional. Uh, we should focus on the real economy. The Troika is not allowing us to focus on the real economy at the moment. But in the future, we hope to change the terms of the debate. So perhaps it would simply help to establish the, the, the terrain of the discussion to to say that in 2015, uh, you have not achieved things which a social democratic government could not have delivered. You've made compromises which a social democratic government might have made. And the difference is very much in terms of hope for the future. So I don't have to press a button for it to start. No, no, no. um, Thank you for that, uh, reminding me of the dinner. I'm a better cook than I am an economist. So uh, um, uh, the, the, one of the interesting questions that has that, that troubled me for a very long time before I got in, so involved in, in politics and as a finance minister in the opposition is why didn't social democracy return after the crisis? Why in 2008 didn't social democrats say neoliberals have been having it for 30 years, it's your crisis, it's your, you're the ones who said that liberalization of the banks would work, now we're going to return to an old uh, priorities and agenda of liberalizing, uh, of, of uh, regulating the banks, uh, some decommodification of welfare state and education and, and, and health, for instance, and uh, some Keynesian demand management. And it's always troubled me why they didn't do that and why they couldn't change the subject. I think it's a very uh, deep running, it's a very deep answer to that question. And I think the answer is that a lot of profits uh, and the recovery of profitability in the area of neoliberalism was because of bank profits. It was because of extension of capitalism to new areas like the banks, like health, like education. So that the model of social democrats reversing that is very difficult to do. Hmm. That if they had then said, we're regulating banks, we're uh, decommodifying partially so that we more public sector input into health and education, that wouldn't be compatible with the uh, rate of profit and they, they would have soon led to problems. So maybe they had an ins instinct that that wasn't uh, part of the agenda. Now, that was a bit theoretical and you might think, Kevin, because you have a cynical side to you, um, that uh, I'm trying to avoid the, the question. So let me try to avoid uh, not avoid the, the question. I think Syriza made a big dent in that neoliberal consensus over the summer, which I don't think any social democrat party, and they've won it, have done so far. In They raised an issue about democracy, and that's why there was a referendum. They raised an issue that led to this is a coup I know, I know. going throughout the, the web pages for a couple of uh, days and weeks. And they raised an issue when somebody like uh, Jürgen Habermas could say that Germany in one day lost what it gained in, four, in 40 years since the Second World War. 
we have put back on the agenda the issue of democracy. We have put back on the agenda the issue for a different kind of cooperation. We've lost a lot as well. I mean, that's in the nature of the compromise, and that's why I've said uh, the deal will only be as good as the left can make of it, can incorporate it into a long-term uh, strategy. Now, as you can understand, at there is a, a, a time scale in this. Enough. The early part, it's a very front-loaded program. Enough. Enough. Uh, but if you look at the MOU, after the, de the presentation of the development strategy in March 2015, it's remarkably bad. If you look, if you actually read the, uh, the MOU. So I think once we have got this balance and we've returned to growth, the question will return. We will, shall see what happens in other economies and whether there is a change in uh, the balance of forces elsewhere in, in Europe. We shall see whether the Greek government can provide space for these kind of alternatives. Um, and I think there are social democrats now who are interested in these kind of uh, alternatives, in rethinking the cooperative movement, in rethinking um, special purpose banks, ethical banks. Uh, I think there is an agenda about the way innovation works for whom, uh, how uh, access to the internet and the commons, the whole commons issue, that there are social democrats who are, are seriously thinking about that. And I think maybe there, there is going to be a reconfiguration. Whether there is, is a, an issue that is well beyond my ability to, to predict. OK, thank you. It would be wrong, of course, to, for anyone to comment on one's predecessor. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a left agenda, and there's questions of tactics. Looking back in 2015, were the tactics uh, well designed to advance the left agenda? Well, let me say that um, Yanis, we were here um, together in late January, early February, uh, when we were just elected. I think for the first month, uh, did a remarkable job in uh, bringing the Greek case to the public attention. Uh, and uh, gained a lot of support, e even in countries like um, uh, Germany. Um, and I think that uh, there is, should be collective responsibility uh, here, uh, here for both the successes and the failures. And I think that Yanis was part of a team. I was part of the team. We got some things right. We got some things uh, wrong. And I, I, I'm not going to, uh, to divide that. We definitely, I think, um, were rather naive on the level of engagement that you need with the European institutions. We, I think, overestimated the ability of politics at a higher level to solve issues by themselves. What I'm saying is that politics, you know, once you reach a certain amount of uh, agreement, you know, politics can come and fill the gap, but you have to do the work. And remember that we were a very green government in both senses, I hope, um, but uh, the ecological one definitely, um, but in the other sense uh, as well, uh, and that we didn't have enough people who could engage quickly and constructively with arguments. Um, we often felt in Walter Mosley's um, uh, detective novel. Unfortunately, he's one of Clinton's favorite uh, novelists, but they, you can't have everything. Uh, one, of the, one of his books, favorite books, is always outnumbered, always outgunned. And the Greek government did feel often that they were always outnumbered, out, uh, always outgunned, even at that technical, um, technocratic um, level. Good, thank you. Opportunity now to open it up to your contributions. I can already see lots of hands. Let me stand uh, here so I can let me stand here so I can see everyone. Could I simply ask you to uh, say your name and then the question? I'm sure many of you would like to make a speech. Sadly, we don't have the time uh, for, for for that. Although perhaps there may be honourable exceptions. Um, so questions, uh, please. Can we? And there are ladies, or there are uh, colleagues, rather, with microphones. Can we take the gentleman over here in the white shirt first? 
And we'll take a group of uh, Bernard, three Bernard questions at the time. Bernard Casey from LSE. Do you think that the fact that Greece is one of the peripheral countries with respect to immigrants coming into Europe has strengthened your hand in negotiations? Thank you. We'll take uh, Mary Caldo at the front, please. A very quick comment, <laughs> which is that I don't think whatever anybody had done the tactics would have been criticised. I mean, when George Papandreou tried to negotiate, he was very, very nice, and it didn't work. <laughs> so that's just one comment. And my question is, you said it depends what happens when we get growth. Are you confident that within the framework mm. of the MOU, you can get growth? Good, thank you. Uh, can we take my colleague in the grey shirt here, please? Thank you, Vasilis Monstiotis, Hellenic Observatory. Um, following the, the question of, of, of Kevin about the left, uh, what the left government can do, you mentioned the, you know, devising a new production system, perhaps, and demand management. Uh, but also, the left is associated with more distribution, uh, perhaps a more social democratic left than uh, a radical left, but still the distribution must be on the table. And I'm really puzzled how Syriza, throughout since January, has not been able to take forward a proposal that was put forward by the IMF, but nevertheless, it is about the minimum income guarantee, poverty alleviation at the very bottom level. There was nothing about extension of unemployment <coughs> benefits, at least the coverage of benefits, not the, the value because you, the money is not there. Uh, and, and also an income, uh, 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 change in income taxation, which is the most distributive that one uh, can do. Instead, we stay with the VAT increases and everything else that is being proposed. So, I can, can you tell us why this was never in the citizens' uh, narrative uh, since January? Okay, let me um, answer those questions in reverse order. Um, I think, Vasily, we have a rather different view of what the uh, guaranteed minimum income, how progressive it is or not. Um, the view of the left is that apart from a guaranteed minimum income, people have access to benefits as rights as citizens. And what the IMF has been pressurizing us is to remove such benefits and just be left with an income support for the poorest of the poor. Um, that isn't progressive and that isn't redistribution, no, uh, at all. Because the problem with guaranteed minimum income, when it's not sold as universal rights for everybody, is that you're at the mercy of the upper middle class and the rich. When they're feeling in good times uh, generous, you get a bit more. When they're feeling less generous, which the present elites are increasingly feeling less generous, you get less. But here is an advantage of having a left-wing government, and I'm glad you asked that. Because Theano Fotiu, who is uh, the minister of, 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 who deals with these issues, turned that discussion around over the summer. And she said, OK, we have had a big solidarity movement in Greece. The Greek government one of its first laws was on the humanitarian crisis. That had a, a card for citizens they could use uh, for um, groceries and so on. So why don't we reach a compromise where certain of those, and that was dealt to about 300,000 people, yeah? It wasn't a small thing. Why don't we use that and some of the rights that we have given to the poor people as citizens and incorporate a compromise between that and the uh, guaranteed minimum income. I don't think the New Democracy or PASOK or anybody else would have negotiated that. They would have just accepted the guaranteed minimum income. And so having a left in government can help in those issues if you can build on that to actually say, well, look, we are dealing with a humanitarian crisis. We're giving benefits to people that they are owed as citizens to be able to participate in uh, society, and let's see how can that can be uh, brought to bear with what your concerns about the gen uh, guaranteed minimum income. Now, I also agree, I, I agree more with Mary Caldwell's first thing about that, and I sh maybe I should have said that about my predecessor, I, I agree with that. 
because the negotiations are very political. And the, at the top of the mind, at the front of the mind of many of our negotiators, negotiators on the other side was that the left should fail because we would be a bad example to others, to Podemos and to the Bloco and so on. So we had to face that from right up front. And you're quite right, tactics may have had their role, but I think Kevin probably exaggerates the, the extent it would have made um, a difference. Maybe it would have made a marginal difference, I don't know, but the, the issue is right, and we still have that. Um, I was gonna say it off the record, but I, it's, everybody knows this, so I might as well say it. Um, the promise was that we would have a discussion on debt, as I said, immediately after the first review, and perhaps reach a deal before Christmas. We're not going to reach a deal before Christmas. Why not? Because the Spaniards have an election on the 21st, and any good deal that Greece has before the 21st might encourage les autres. In other words, encourage the, the wrong people in Spain. So the, the politics is very important from the beginning. Now the growth question. The answer is that one never knows. Um, it depends also on things outside Greece, what's happening to the Eurozone. Uh, today in the ECOFIN, which is like the Eurozone, but, but the country, all the 28, not just the Eurozone members, uh, there was a discussion about fiscal policy and better coordinated fiscal policy where I, I made my sort of first contribution on something non-Greek, where I argued that um, we, Pierre Moscovici uh, presented some figures which were not rosy about Eurozone uh, economic growth and said it was something to do with China not doing so well and, and so on. And I said, well, it actually isn't exogenous. Yes, the Eurozone is not a small open economy. Yeah? It can't ignore its effect on the world economy. Perhaps Germany could. Um, so if the world economy isn't doing well, then the European economy um, is, has some role in that, in, in reversing that. It can't just be indifferent uh, to that. So there are things outside of our, our control, uh, but I think there are prospects. I mean, you know, we've had such a big recession that, you know, the, that in itself may, may help. I think it will change the mood if we pass these, th this roadmap that I said, the recapitalization, the closing of the first review, and the debt uh, issue. And it obviously, it also depends on the, the development model that we provide. As I said, I'm not a particular Keynesian. I think it just gives us breathing space for a, for a development model to, to, to work. And that's why I think it's like um, devaluation. Um, I think, to the first question, uh, it probably does. I'll uh, just remind people, does the, the refugee crisis um, strengthen the Greeks' hands? I think there are a lot of Europeans who think that we can't have too many crises at the same time. I think that's how, how it works, that there are geopolitical uh, st uh, at fault. There was, again, a discussion on the ECOFIN. Um, the, at the end, one person did mention it, but the emperor that was walking naked up and down and nobody was uh, actually mentioning in the ECOFIN was um, apart from the economic costs of refugees and how we have to cooperate and some, you know, small progressives saying that, you know, we've got to cooperate for economics, the less progressives saying we've got to build up more walls and we will never save it, solve the issue unless we stop them coming. Um, nobody really mentioned that we could actually try to do something a bit more about stopping wars, yes, uh, and developing, uh, helping development in those countries, and maybe that could be a, a particularly novel, but not brilliant, I would have thought. It's not rocket science way of solving the refugee crisis. Thanks. Let's have another round of uh, questions. Can we take the colleague here, please? Hi, uh, Pangos a student here at the LSE. Minister, you just mentioned that uh, the Greek government constantly felt outnumbered and outgunned. And my question has to do with recent political developments in Europe. Uh, we see that in Portugal there is a government that can be characterized as anti-austerity coming to power. Uh, there's the Spanish election soon with Podemos, although looking unlikely, you know, challenging, might challenge the, the winning the election. So we see also Jeremy Corbyn as the leader of the opposition position in, uh, in England. And also you have two governments in Italy and in France which cannot be characterized necessarily left-wing, but it can be argued that if an anti-austerity uh, wave was to come in Europe, there would not be obstacles. So my question is, is, do you believe that there is 
actually an anti-austerity wave in Europe? And if so, can Greece take advantage of it? Thank you. Thank you. Let's have the gentleman in the blue shirt here, just on the second row, please. Euclid, since I've been the beneficiary of your recipe for stuffed eggplant, I too hope you're as creative a left-wing finance minister as you are a cook. Uh, I think you know that the Solidarity Network activists do not feel that the priority that you gave to them in your strategy in terms of the solidarity economy, in terms of decommodified health and education services uh, are at the top of your mind. Uh, and there is therefore, well, one of them said to me uh, the day after you were f forced to sign <clears throat> the latest memorandum that she didn't know whether to shoot herself or to shoot you. Uh, how do you respond to this? On the question of shooting? Um, can we take the gentleman in the white shirt just to your right, please? Dimitri Monudis, uh, Professor Tsakalotos. Uh, you referred to your predecessor earlier. What is your assessment um, regarding the options offered by your old comrades of exiting the euro or exiting the EU as, uh, as a total scene that uh, nothing seems to be changing over the recent years? You thought my questions were antagonistic. Anyway, Hilary. <laughs> Hilary Wainwright, Red Pepper Magazine and the Transnational Institute. So I wanted to, uh, I thought your talk was really good and really interesting, and I just wanted to ask you to say a little bit more on this whole issue of the space that you think you can open up for the solidarity economy, for public health. Um, and in particular, you know, the, the, the issue of the balance of forces, that in a way, the question of space then requires actors to make use of that space and to, to take creative initiatives. And that's particularly true, well, in solidarity economy, privatization. So I wanted to, and, and from what I gather, you know, and I've not you know, been there recently, but there's a very low level of, of sort of energy. People feel very demoralized. Leo gave that story. Um, so what can you say and do that will kind of re-energize people to, to put the pressure to make use, of, not just pressure, but take the initiatives to make use of that space? And I wondered particularly, you know, Leo's asked about the solidarity economy. I think one area where I'd just ask you to say a bit more is the whole issue of privatization, where there was a lot of energy, particularly around water, to, to defend water as a commons. Um, but now there's a real feeling of defeat and, you know, they just don't have the energy to sort of fight anymore. And so what can, well, I'm not saying this is going to be easy, but what can you say or what can the party say that will kind of provide the energy that can, that can make use of those spaces and push? Okay, thank you. Okay, do you want to take those first? Yeah. Um, let me start with the exiting the EU question. I don't, I don't want to rehash the, the, the arguments that have been discussed amongst the Greek left for a very long time now. Uh, let me just say that um, I've never supported the exiting of the EU, in part because I don't think it addresses the, the main issues that are facing the left over the coming period. Um, whether it's uh, tax competition, whether it's environmental issues, whether it's control of multinationals or um, uh, the finance, it seems to me that the main issues are supranational in nature and therefore they need a supranational uh, solution. That's why I've um, always opposed the strategy of leaving the EU. Um, I don't think it challenges the heart of capitalist hegemony, which is competition and competitiveness and a different kind of economic model. Uh, because if, you, if I'm a finance minister and I devalue, what am I going to tell my comrades in Spain and Portugal, that they should have an even bigger devaluation? 
to become competitive? I don't think that's the right answer. But there's something more important. So that's, that was last year's debate, for, for me at least. The critique on the left and those people leaving the party, since you asked me, um, is too simple. And it's too simple because why the left didn't do as well as it could have done in its first term is not because it didn't leave the euro. It's because of the kind of questions that Leo and Hillary uh, are putting up. Why wasn't there a mobilization in a large number of areas which could have helped the, the left in, uh, in Greece and opened up new agendas? That's the critical issue to me. Uh, because otherwise, you presuppose what is, uh, what is to be proven. And what you presuppose is that people are already left wing and that uh, they are just waiting for a big move like leaving the, the euro for that left wingness to be materialized. Whereas I think the left is uh, ideologically challenged in many ways. We have to convince people that um, public ownership and social ownership is better than private ownership, that collective solutions are better than individual uh, solutions, and that needs uh, alternative paradigms. Um, it's one thing for opposing uh, water privatization, Hillary would tell you. It's another thing to oppose water privatization while at the same time presenting a new model of how it could work, and that model being uh, prereq uh, an example for others to, to follow. So then I go to the question of Hillary uh, and Leo, and why didn't that happen? Why didn't the left in the first five or six months have this? And this is where we disagree with the Social Democrats, I think, Kevin, to answer, because I don't think the Social Democrats have even lost that as part of the equation, the idea of actually mobilizing people to change the balance of forces. It was something the Social Democrats definitely understood in the interwar period and before the First World uh, Period, but it's not one I think they've, they, they, it's somewhere along the line, that, that, that lesson was, was lost. So the question then arises, why didn't that happen? Uh, I mean, my guess is as good as yours, but let me tell you the, the sequencing. You see, after the crisis, Greek people were actually very energetic and tried everything. They tried, tried the example of the town squares and like the uh, Podemos in Spain. They tried general strikes. They tried the solidarity movement. Nothing worked, yes, for the first four years. And so I think they made a collective choice that only politics could change things. And when Tsipras in the summer, let me get this right, of 2012 said we're actually going for government, that's when it changed everything. Yes, and Syriza from, you know, from 5% went to 14 and 17 and 29 and went to government. But the flip side of that was that people said, instead of continuing doing what they were doing, in, you know, they stopped it and say, well, now there's going to be the series of government, they will do it. Whereas that's not a model that the left can actually take forward because you actually need active participants um, who are pressurizing for different kinds of social policies, uh, not necessarily in time of crisis with more money, but for changing who social policy is for, who is consulted about the nature of that social policy, so that the victims actually become subjects of what that social policy is about. And that wasn't, um, uh, we weren't able to, for, to continue that. It's not really a question for a finance minister, really, left or otherwise. Um, it's a question for the whole political body, yes? What, I, mean, I mean, the left makes in statistical, to use a statistical analysis, both type one errors and type two errors. That is, we often predict that there's going to be social mobilization and there isn't. And then we also make the type two error. We say there's no, nothing is moving and then suddenly it happens. So for reasons that are not clear to me, it's quite difficult to, to predict when social mobilization starts. Um, but if the question is, is the series as, my basic thesis, why, to answer Leo now, um, uh, about the sol why the solidarity activists and the people wanting the partial decommodification in health, um, 
I think in health we're going to surprise them positively, but, but the question still remains. Um, for those people, it, it, the, the question, if you pose my question, which was, can we incorporate the memorandum and the deal within a progressive uh, exit of the crisis, is absolutely dependent on the questions that you and, and Hillary have raised. Yes, so the answer, I can actually tell you the answer now. If we don't, the answer is no. If we do, the answer is possibly. Um, so, I, so I can be quite uh, direct on that. And finally, on the first question, um, well, yes, there is an anti-austerity um, wave, but it's not only of the left. So that's the downside. Um, the anti-austerity is golden dawn in Greece. This is the third party's anti-austerity. Le Pen is anti-austerity, and some pretty unpleasant people elsewhere in, in, in Europe are anti-austerity. So anti-austerity isn't enough. And that's why it is important that um, the, the left uh, is able to mobilize and inspire on something different. Because if we don't get this right, the, um, the, the ultra-right and the sort of racist right is, um, um, is, is on, on the rise. And that will be part of the failure of the left. Um, for instance, the refugee thing, just to the, the previous question, um, is not going as well the last 10 days than it was the previous 10 days. Hopefully it's a cyclical uh, phenomenon and not a trend. Um, because uh, there's backtracking. Yeah? There's a huge rouse within the popular party about the best way to approach it. And I'm worried that unless um, there is forward movement, we, we, that could turn as a boomerang. Let's see. Let's, I hope more you know, than anything that I'm wrong on that prediction. Thanks. Let's have another round of questions. The lady with the blue top, please. If you could just wait for the microphone to come, please. Hello. Um, my name is Liana Maga. And I would like to ask you something about um, brain drain. You said um, that Greece's youth unemployment is currently above 50%. And from personal experience and from all of my friends that are here in this room as well, I, I can say that a lot of us have left Greece um, because we feel like there is, no, there is not an option there for, uh, for us to find a paid job. Um, as a finance minister, what do you have to tell to, to say to our generation? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman right at the very back, uh, next to the camera. Uh, hi, Manos Kubulas, uh, graduate student at LSE. Um, given that there is almost parity between the economically active and inactive uh, people in Greece, what's the plan to make the whole system sustainable? And uh, why should uh, the companies stay in Greece uh, when they have the opportunity to go to Bulgaria, for example, uh, instead of the hostile business environment of Greece. Thank you. Thanks. Let's go upstairs. The gentleman in the uh, red shirt. Thank you. Uh, Nasser Kalawun, uh, commentator on BBC and Arab channels on Greek crisis since it started. So my question to you is about money since you are for, uh, a finance minister. The privatization program, $50 billion of Greek assets, didn't go further in the last four years. Are you still afraid of foreign ownership, Arab ownership, despite approaches from Qatar and other private sector from the Arab world, or German hands to take your uh, airports? Do you have a time frame as a condition to uh, offload the, uh, you know, the Greek assets, or do you think you will fail on this one as with the EU? Thank you. Okay, I think there's another question upstairs. Uh, yes, the gentleman uh, in the middle of the back, please. Yeah, Mike, Mike Davis. Um, I'm involved in the Greece Solidarity Campaign. I was very pleased to hear Euclid uh, several months before he actually became the minister he is today in Parliament as, as a meeting that he addressed with the Greece Solidarity Campaign of, of MPs. Uh, obviously, a lot of water under the bridge. Uh, and I've recently returned from Greece on a delegation. One of the things that concerned me 
and, and some of the members of the delegation was what was happening in the port of Piraeus. And actually, as we were there, we were unable to meet um, um, Euclid and others because it was the day you were being sworn in and being, uh, making speeches and so on in Parliament. We did meet Costas, who uh, was able to come and speak to us. But he was very concerned that the contract for the privatisation process, which I think a lot of us accept, has partially got to go through, also included a whole tranche of the coastline with uh, public buildings, public facilities, parks, and all sorts of resources. And I wonder what progress you've been able to make on clawing back part of that um, um, contractual uh, problem that you had. And to just reiterate the question about space that Hillary talked about, because that was the message we got from Syriza um, when we were there, that we need to create the space. Give us some time, and as you've said, you know, we can't make any strong judgments right now, but give us, the sp give us time to create the space for this creative action, for this creative work to be done, and we could make progress. And I wonder if you could give us any other examples of where you think the creative space could be, create could be made that will enable the movement to re-emerge and to re be re-energised, re and what we can do in Britain okay. to help that process. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm afraid you have major topics uh, for each of them, but please. Um. Right. Let, let me uh, say something about the economic active versus the inac inactive and the imbalance there and what, uh, in other words, one of the things we parked, the pension scheme. One of the problems in the Greek economy is that it has institutions and policies that are being called upon to deal with issues that they're not fit to deal with. So why is it difficult to reform the pension scheme and why are we arguing for a more gradual approach? Because you can have a granny in Greece with 800 euros um, uh, pension, but it's not a pension really because it's also paying for her granddaughter who's unemployed and is also paying for some other son. So. That really, sorry. Well, let me say, but at the moment, you, you can change the pension scheme, but unless you sort out the, the other issue, the social the unemployment insurance, or unless you have an active labour market policy, so that the, the people can, and I'll come back to that because it's the, the first question on um, unemployed youth and, and so on. It's very difficult to change the the pension scheme uh, because it's very difficult to change a pension scheme while at the same time in, including an unemployment insurance uh, proper unemployment benefit scheme and having an active labour market scheme. But I think that the I didn't like the way the question was posed. Not that I'm supposed to criticise the way questions are posed. So let me say that, that there, there's something questionable about the, how the, quest, the question was posed. Because I think that what the series is about is not to make such distinctions. Because I think that the divide and rule of the previous governments between private sector workers and public sector workers, old workers and young workers, uh, skilled and unskilled, active and inactive, was a way of dividing people. And uh, it was very successful for, uh, for, a long, for a big part of the time. And I think people realize now that social solidarity is what's called for. And that uh, there is, um, I, I think there is a way of going forward that the terms active and inactive are not the terms I would use. Um, because a lot of people who are inactive were very active in, part, in, in their past and deserve our respect and we need to find a solution that takes uh, into account both. I, I, I'm not going to answer the question about the hostile environment for investment. I don't think that's the case. Um, Syriza government has, from, the, from its, uh, its programme before the elections of 2012, 2012 had, had uh, announced that it, where it wanted investment, how it was looking forward to joint ventures, but it has criteria. It has criteria. Um, uh, the idea of the right that you can call for investment 
that the private sector can invest where it wants, what it wants, on, a, on any criterion that it wants, doesn't actually help the development. And all the work on development in the post-war period actually shows that. So it's quite important to have criterion in specific areas, helping to the investment make sure that it builds up the, social, the, the, the local skill base, that it, uh, it, it protects the environment and passes the environment on to the next generation. These are important parts of all development strategies, and most of successful development strategies have taken them um, into uh, account. So the, I can then fall close straight to the privatization question, having said that, the, on, the, on whether it's, um, we're open to, the, to privatization from uh, abroad. Of course, we're open to FDI and uh, involvement in, 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 in privatizations. The, the new fund that we have, though, uh, will take uh, on board some of the assets of the Greek economy, and it will decide, because we only have to pay that uh, debt over the uh, long period, over the period of the loan, of the ESM loan, and so there'll be assets in there, some that can be sold off, some that can be nurtured and within, with joint ventures. So there's a lot of uh, solutions and a lot of way of, of planning um, uh, uh, partnerships. Uh, on the port of Piraeus, the, there was a renegotiation, Mike, and uh, one of the issues was the, the um, Trapezona, which is one of the regions in the area, and we've negotiated that these people should have access to the coast, which they wanted for the last. Before that, you'll know it was a fertilizer plant, so they never have actually had. So it's a whole region close to the sea, which has the outrageous um, thing that they don't actually have access to have a walk by the sea. So we've renegotiated the deal so that, that there a big part of that can be developed so that these people can have um, access. Um, there. But this, the, the one million dollar question, I think, is the first one about the the young people and the the prospects of the the brain drain uh, uh, and and so on. And this is the, the hardest question. I, I I don't think that a, a a government of the left can be in power over the next two years unless unemployment seriously reduces. I don't think we'll have the political support. So it is one of our priorities. Yes, it is our priority. It has to be. Yes, because I can I can I can you know I can wager whatever you like that if unemployment of youth doesn't reduce rapidly and unemployment generally doesn't, within a two-year period, then the, the, the government of the left will fall. So we have every, it's not like it's, it's one of the issues amongst others. We know that this is a litmus test. And part of that is to see in, in, in what way that we can be innovative in attracting back the, the brain drain. And this kind of thing we've been arguing against the old um, memorandum programs, that it seems odd that they're pressurizing for internal devaluation. In other words, competitiveness on low wages, where it's not clear that Greece has any comparative advantage in low wage uh, development, with given the number of PhDs and master's students, which must be one of the top in, in, the, in the EU per head of um, population. So we're looking at a number of strategies which will be incorporated, if you remember from my talk, that we have to prevent, pre present our development plan to the institutions by um, uh, March the 2015. Um, the good news is we have a very active uh, young lady from, who's come to us um, from America, who is the employment, uh, the, the sort of junior employment minister, Rani Andonopoulou, who has a lot of ideas about how to deal with schemes in the short run, but much more um, ambitious plans over the long run. So it is a litmus test for the, for the Greek government. So you, all you have is my uh, pledge that it's high up uh, in our list of priorities, partly for self-interest. One more question now. Okay. Uh, there's the lady with a hand up over here, please. Hi, uh, Ali Renison. I uh, run Europe and Trade Policy at the Institute of Directors. And um, I, I was in Athens during the elections because I know you say that there's 
not a hostile investment uh, climate, but we've had a lot of our members cut back their exposure and investments in Greece over the last few years, and they want to know, they want evidence that there is a more receptive climate. And my question is, is that you talk about, um, you know, the energy that you bring to wanting to change um, uh, models, socioeconomic models in Greece, but I wonder how much you're willing to be in listening mode as well as leading mode, because one of the things that I took away from Athens was all of my friends who run startups say uh, they just don't understand about running the business and profit margins and overheads. Um, and they want to stay in Greece, but they also want to know they're being listened to. And there were a lot of complaints from business okay. groups that I spoke to that, that you were only listening to trade unions. And so how do you prove that you're open and willing to engage um, across the, se the spectrum? Thanks. Okay, perhaps in terms of time, should we leave that as the last question, or you have one more? Another one question, the gentleman uh, here, please. Nikos Pronios, uh, how do you correlate the development that you mentioned with the competitiveness of the Greek economy? Should we have those then, those <coughs> last uh, two questions? Well, um, listening mode. Um, <coughs> I don't think you can be uh, have talked to a random sample of the Greek population. Um, we've actually made very big steps in helping startups. We've been listening very careful, carefully to what are the obstacles to those startups, uh, what is red tape and what isn't red tape. And uh, I think that if you look at the progress that's been made, and the number of issues in the memorandum which are specifically addressed to the questions you've raised, you'd be very surprised. Especially, you'd be very surprised that numbers have be, uh, that have actually um, uh, have, have passed. Um, one of the things that uh, private investors have said is about corruption, uh, apart from the issues that you mentioned. And one of the things that we have a better relationship with our creditors than others is that they believe that this government can actually deal with the corruption. Uh, because the previous governments, both New Democracy and PASOK, were for many years built a clientelistic system. Uh, one of the reasons why the banks, have, as I said, were forced, uh, are being forced to have such an autonomous view, an autonomous government structure, is because of the links between the state the private banks and fir individual firms, individual people, individual football teams. Yeah? And so the environment can change by, by dealing with, with uh, corruption. I've understood that the private sector would like certain rules to be stable. And this addresses actually a question that I, I didn't answer before about uh, why should, um, firms should stay and not uh, go to um, Bulgaria. Well, there's lots of reasons. Um, firms' locations policy is not just based on, on wages. It's based on a whole set of things uh, about com uh, that, that, comp that make up for competitiveness, to answer uh, your question. And that what they really want is a stable environment. Uh, what is what the private sector is looking for is a stable environment, and that is what hasn't happened. And one of the reasons hasn't happened is historical in Greece. I mean, since the Ottoman times, um, it's not surprising that Greek uh, industry has been focused in areas of footloose capital, banks, shipping. And why was that? Because since the, I mean, the Ottoman, I mean, you can have different views about how authoritarian the Ottomans were compared to their equivalents in Eastern Europe or medieval Europe at the time. But one of the things they were, were, were arbitrary. And the Greek new state after the 1820s continued to be arbitrary. So the rules were here today, gone tomorrow. And that's what helped the clientelistic system. Because if the rules are going to be changed all the time, you need political leverage, shall I put it like this, to make sure that your deal is done. And that's the kind of thing that we need to break. 
to be able then to attract private sector money, to understand that the rules are the rules, that they won't be changed, and knowing Euclid doesn't make a hoot of a difference. Um, that hasn't been the case for previous finance ministers. Knowing the previous finance and development minister and the uh, uh, employment minister and the energy minister has made a very, very big difference. I can, uh, I can tell you, I can assure you of that. And that, I think, and let me end with this, I think, um, I mean, I, I have a, a big issue about competitiveness um, um, I actually agree with Krugman on this one. A actually, if, if you look at neoclassical economics uh, and trade theory, it says if you do better, you will do better. Now, that doesn't sound brilliant, and only economists can say, but what does it say? It doesn't matter what anybody else does. If you increase your productivity, you will do better, irrespective of whatever e anybody else does. That actually comes from neoclassical uh, economics. So competitiveness, i.e. doing better than somebody else, is not nearly as important as ensuring that you actually increase your productivity overall. And you can increase your productivity in a whole host of ways beyond reducing wages. And part of the new economic model that I think the left, both in its social democratic and leftist um, approach, has to deal with that issue that you can actually incorporate a lot of social considerations in a wider understanding of uh, increasing productivity and feedbacks and externalities between the social and the economic and the economic and the politics for a very su successful economic uh, program. The idea that you pitch worker against worker, region against region, and I'm not suggesting you were saying that, I'm just answering the question with them, um, given what you've told me, that it is has been a dead end, because very often, more often than not, it becomes, uh, uh, um, you know, I gain and you lose, rather than everybody gaining at the same time. So that's uh, I'm not a great fan of competitiveness as it's used, uh, in fact, and uh, I think its increased use in the last 30 years is not correlated uh, with increased economic performance. The productivity figures uh, since the 70s, the late 70s, are poor. Oh, good. OK. Uh, Eflidis has had a very long day. He started in Brussels with Ecofin, went to speak to um, bankers and uh, hedge funds, etc., and then has finished it on a high here at the LSE with academics and uh, fellow uh, sympathizers. Thank you very much indeed for uh, your presentation and your uh, willingness to answer so many different questions. Welcome. Uh, I'm tempted to say that you remain maddening and uh, deeply persuasive <laughs> uh, in equal measure. Uh, on these occasions, uh, it's our pleasure to acknowledge the, uh, your visit. And of course, educational institutions in the present uh, austerity climate in the UK <coughs> You wouldn't expect me to give a gift of tremendous value, would you? Please say no. No, thank you. <laughs> Certainly not. And so therefore, <laughs> let me give you a, a gift uh, from the LSE uh, as a commemoration of your uh, visit uh, here. But also we have a tradition at the LSE of uh, our uh, speakers uh, being presented with this particular cap. You may recall that we, we're very good in British universities with ceremonies. And so, for example, <laughs> we're very good with that. Can you please join me? Thank you very much.